Like other e-commerce giants around the world, Jumia, sometimes called the Amazon of Africa, experienced a surge in demand amid the pandemic. But the, the big difference here is that the format, formal retail sector on the African continent is still early in its development compared to other major regions. This means many brands and retailers are actually leapfrogging physical retail and going direct to consumer, just as African customers did with banks and mobile money a decade ago. While Jumia is by far the biggest player on the continent, operating across 12 different countries, its journey hasn't been without its challenges. But the pandemic has proven the long-term potential of African e-commerce and the rise of platforms like Jumia, the surge in mobile payments and peer-to-peer -peer selling are all driving an e-commerce boom. Some of you may have already seen our interview with Juliet Anama in this year's State of Fashion 2021 report, but I found the conversation so interesting, I thought it was worth going in a bit deeper with Juliet here at Voices. So now I'm pleased to turn it over to Zane Virgi and Juliet Anama. Over to you, Zane. Hi, Imran, thank you so much. It's so great to see you. Thank you for having me again as part of Voices this year. So in Swahili, Asante Sana. I'm from Kenya and in my work, I travel all over Africa. I book my flights on Jumia to get around. My friends actually went grocery shopping online for the first time this year on Jumia. And more and more Africans seem open to online payments. All of this is a really big deal in Africa because it underscores a shift in mindset. Joining us now is Juliet Anama, the chair of Jumia Nigeria. Juliet, great to see you. How are you day? I do. Good to see you too. <laughs> I do. <day can't> <laughs> yes. <laughs> My ogre, madame at the top. Uh, happy to see you, as I said. Let's get into it. Uh, how big of an e-commerce boost did Africa really get with the COVID lockdowns? Um, thanks, Jane, for that question. I think um, the first thing is to understand that for eight years, we were working on convenience. So we were, we built a platform and we built a service which was really providing convenience, right, for, for people on, on, in Africa. But what happened with COVID was a greater understanding that is more than convenience, it is really an essential service. Um, given what happened, the situations where you had lockdowns and restrictions and people couldn't, couldn't move and the only means in which they could do anything was digitally. But also on, on the continent, also realize that this is where um, it is more of a mindset shift, like you said, that has happened this year. And uh, not so much a drastic change in terms of shopping patterns, right? And we think that over time, over 2021, 2022, having gone through the process and go, having gone through the experience of COVID, that that mindset shift is here to stay. Certainly in some countries where you had um, a full country lockdowns, yes, there was a, you know, a significant uh, increase in, in online sales uh, versus other countries that didn't have that kind of right. systemic lockdown. Yeah. So well, just paint us a picture, Juliet, about how life changed specifically for one reluctant customer. Just, just walk us through, like, what were you seeing the purchases look like? What, what was noticeably changed in terms of what was being bought? Yeah, so people would traditionally have bought online uh, things like electronics, right, and phones. So discretionary items were the kind of things that people before now would have bought online to a greater extent, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But when we, when you even when you look at our numbers at the end of Q3 20, uh, Q3 this year, you see that a significant percentage is now about fast-moving consumer goods just basic groceries, right? Uh, people would buy diapers for their babies. People would buy you know, basic packaged food items. Uh, in Kenya, during the uh, pandemic, we had a partnership with Twigger Foods and people could buy groceries as well. Um, all of a sudden we have some informal market sellers in, 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 in uh, Uganda as well. 
who are selling online and they're selling fresh vegetables on Jumia as well. So these are the things that have changed. Okay. Uh, the perception of the fact that I can use, wow, I can buy so many more things online than I used to do before. Before people had a narrow view of what they could do online. Now they're buying a lot more things online. Will this boon last? I think that the perception that I will get what I can, the basic items that I require online, it's here to stay. Okay, because once people have experienced something, it just it doesn't go away. You have a, the experience of shopping for grocery items online. You're not going to forget that tomorrow. It's going to stay, especially as we're going into the reality of Africa also being that some countries also hit economically. And therefore, people are very much careful about how they spend their money. So being able to go on online and buy things uh, at the right price points, you know that you can get the best prices online. That's a habit that's here to stay. As we move through this pandemic, the challenges still don't necessarily go away, right? Like, yeah. like poor infrastructure, challenging and, and inefficient logistics. I mean, now it's okay because the traffic jams aren't as bad <laughs> in Nairobi <laughs> or Lagos. No, wait, they're always bad in Lagos. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, but like, you know, you can deliver stuff faster because the jams no, are not there. Uh, yeah. But the issues are, are still quite challenging for Jumia and for other e-commerce companies. Yeah, I mean, my answer to that is, you know, there's no time in Africa where it's not challenging, right? Uh, it's a question of what is the prevailing challenge at this point in time and how do you build solutions around it? At any point in time, logistics has always been challenging, but the way we've built out our logistics makes it much more efficient and allows us to deliver to every corner of every country where we operate, whether it's a remote area or a city area. Or how, how does the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement in Africa give a boost to Jumia and other e-commerce companies? Yeah, so the, the entire idea about the CFT, CFTFA, I keep getting the acronym wrong, is, <laughs> is really about is intercontinental free trade. So this is about open borders, more or less. And, uh, you know, every country can ship something from one country to the other. And they really should get there much faster. And there's trade. The biggest benefit for that will be, of course, that we are opening opportunities for small, medium enterprises across the country. Okay, we can ship so much more into inter African trade, and that will open up uh, countries, uh, create opportunities, take people out of poverty, and so on. Okay. For platforms like ours that are already in countries within the continent, right, also, it is an opportunity to then also expand in terms of inter-country trade. So within Jumia, we have 11 countries where we operate. We have, you can order on Jumia platform in Nigeria if you're based in Nigeria. You can also order in Morocco if you're based in Morocco. But the opportunity will be that a Nigerian consumer can order something from a consumer in Morocco and vice versa. So you could have those regional uh, interactions in terms of transactions. You could also have it cross, cross continent as well. So it's a good opportunity when it, if it's, uh, once it takes off. Some of the criticism uh, around uh, conversations I've had with entrepreneurs has also been about how the government could do a lot more, be a lot more collaborative when it comes to supporting digital platforms. Do you agree with that? And if so, what is it that you think are the specific things that governments should be doing on the continent? I, I think that where we are, and especially post-COVID, um, we see a lot of governments in Africa very much interested in and how do they leverage digital? Okay, how do, you, how do you accelerate the growth of the digital economy? Because they see the potential. So my response to that is yes, but there are also other things which you can do to catalyze that growth. And so it's a partnership, a win-win partnership between government and platforms like ours that are going to lead to those kinds of, of, of growth. Um, and there are many things they can do. They can help in terms of how we take different, they can identify some value chains they want to take online and we can have partnerships around how we do that. Uh, the Moroccan government, for example, uh, we have a partnership to bring the uh, handicraft sellers online. And that's something that was initiated by the government of uh, Morocco, the Ministry of Handicrafts. There are many things that can be done. It can be fiscal 
uh, incentives that make it more attractive for people to, to buy online versus buying offline. For many years in the US, Amazon, when you bought something on Amazon, you didn't pay any sales tax. So those are kinds of initiatives that uh, government can also uh, do in Africa to catalyze that shift. One of the problems to solve on the continent is how do you build trust in e-commerce? Going forward, how do you see it? I think that battle is won. Um, maybe five years ago, um, when, uh, when we started, people were still talking about, okay, how do you build trust? How do people uh, you know, feel comfortable paying online? And, and that's why we started with cash on delivery. So you, you have the option, if, you, if you're not yet comfortable, you can wait until the item comes to you and then you pay. Fast forward to today, and I think a lot more people are much more confident that um, uh, if, I, if I order it online, it will, it will arrive. Okay. And I, I don't think that the trust element is, is, a, is, a big, as, is as big as a concern as it used to be like five or six years ago. Then what would you say is? I think it, on, the, on the continent, of course, great opportunities and every day there's still, there's still a, a lot of challenges. And incidentally, when, um, when we do surveys and we ask consumers uh, who know about Jumia, but they haven't tried Jumia, and they say to us, well, you know, I don't know how to shop online. Okay. So it's, it's those little things about how do you shop online? You show someone an app and he may not even know how to open the app or how to use the app. So it's a constant educational process. Uh, but with more, um, over time, it's getting better and better. And we think that over the years, maybe the next two, three years, uh, it's, it's, we, can, we can practically get quite a number of people who, who, who no longer say that I know about Jumia and that I don't know how to shop online. When you look back on uh, Jumia's uh, business trajectory, uh, there were some mistakes that were made in the past, right? So when, when an entrepreneur who's watching this asks uh, you or would like to learn, what, is, what are some of the mistakes that Jumia made in the past when it comes to e-commerce that we can learn from today through the pandemic and going forward the next five, 10 years? I, I would say that, you know, for, I would take it from my perspective. And what I have learned, not just from Jumia, but also my, my entire trajectory of my career, you know, there are always opportunities to learn. And two things that I've, I, I, I tend to share with my teams, and which is what I would tell any entrepreneur, is don't bellyache over decisions that are completely reversible. Okay? There are two types of decisions. One, reversible and irreversible. Okay? Uh, a reversible a decision is like, where do I put a top banner on the website? Well, if I put it on top and it doesn't work, put it down tomorrow, right? It's completely reversible. An irreversible decision is hiring the wrong person. You can fire the person, but you wasted HR's time and you've, uh, you've also uh, burned the team because you know, people feel very unhappy when someone leaves because the person was asked to leave. So those kinds of things... Uh, are things I teach my teams, and I think these are things I would tell an entrepreneur. I would tell an entrepreneur, if you have 70, 80% of the information to make a judgment, go ahead. Don't wait till you have 100% because you lose speed, right? Uh, if you don't have up to 30%, wait. Get all the information, get at least 70% and make the right judgment call. So I think in everything, it's an opportunity to learn and we, and we just move on. How do you see consumer uh, adoption and retention in 2021? I think it, it will keep going up. It will keep growing um, because ultimately um, the consumer is about three things that they want. What I want to buy, convenience of buying that item, the price point at which I buy it. As long as you can provide those three things and you understand the basket of the consumer what type of items that fit into their budget. You will always be in the sweet spot of what the consumer, where the consumer is going to spend their money on. So I, I see that continuing. Uh, we see that uh, those uh, growth opportunities still out there in e-commerce on, on the continent. And, and, and one, one more for me here, uh, Juliet. What would you say is the biggest takeaway in this conversation today that you can, you can tell our audience about e-commerce in Africa? I think I will, I will say um, more than e-commerce is about Africa, okay? Africa is, 
is a continent where I was speaking to someone yesterday and they say there's one word that I will always talk about is that word is resilience. Okay. It's the, is the resilience to fight back. It's the resilience that says no matter how difficult it is, no matter what the challenges are, we're going to find the right solutions and we're going to make it work. That's been our story in junior. That's been my story for a large part of my career. And that's the story of Africa. And that's what makes me happy to be African because you know, no matter what happens, we're going to find a way and we're going to make it work. And uh, every year is better than the, the last year. I, I lied, actually. I have one more <laughs> question. <laughs> My sister, I have you here. Actually, it's just a bit more personal. You know, how do you think you've changed from, say, January 2020? And then what we've seen, go, everybody going through this year, both from a, a Jumia standpoint, from a personal standpoint, yeah. uh, to, to today, how, how are you different? I'm different from the perspective of what I've done, my, my new role. Okay, so I actually have a dual role. I'm a chair of, of Jumia Nigeria, but I'm also the head of institutional affairs for the, for the group. And in the last seven months or thereabouts, I've, I've spent all my time thinking outside of the market, you know, competition, consumers and all that. I've been thinking about the non-market environment and as a social cultural environment, the political environment in Africa, what's, what are the implications of all of that for e-commerce, for digital economy on the Continent. And I have a greater understanding of how business is essentially part of society. So business is not only an economic entity, business is also a social entity, it's also a political entity, and it's very important that uh, we, we, are, we are operating in a manner in which we're very aware of those and we are, we are shaping what happens uh, in those non-market uh, arena, so to speak. So that's, that's a new perspective that I have. Of, uh, of how a business operates in its, in, its, in its environment. And that's been something I've learned this year. Thank you so much, <laughs> <laughs> Juliet. Anama, our Olga, Madame at the top. <laughs> now you be Olga, Madame. Ah, Olga, Madame. Well, we go see now, okay? We yeah. uh, hand it back right. to uh, Imran and, and give him a little bit of pigeon to, to end his day, right? Yeah, Imran, we go, go see. see now. We go see now, yes. <laughs> That means I have a good rest of the day. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Zane and Juliet, uh, for your time.